etcetera. And this time around what we are going to see is that it can be embedded into into uh, an example where the singularity actually goes away. Okay. And uh, historically the uh, the the first uh, uh, such solution was due to Tuft and also Polyakov, but those were the days of the Cold War or whatever, and so communication wasn't really. I mean, so this is from the Eastern Bloc and this is from the Western Bloc, so lots of people followed this work. But it's truly these two people they constructed. Uh, solution. So, actually, when you when I say they constructed a solution, they actually uh, uh, two for instance doesn't quite write an he puts an ansatz for it, and uh, he can estimate he can show that uh, that has the correct uh, charges etcetera that it satisfies the boundary conditions, but uh, he doesn't have an exact estimate. So, for instance, he cannot estimate the mass of the monopole. So, on dimensional grounds he will get some some object which looks like some something like this times some unknown function with some arguments. And what he did was to carry out some numerical integrations to have some estimate of these things. So, it was really an approximate uh, solution where I mean he could guess a lot of features etcetera just based on topology. And, uh, but uh, pretty much uh, so this happened in 1974 okay and pretty much uh, uh, following at the heels of this so this so this is a solution where so this uh, this uh, the starting point is uh, so3 which is broken down to a u1 okay so the monopole here is uh, magnetically charged under this u1 in so3 there is no meaning there's no charge but it's a non abelian thing Okay, so, here when you mean a monopole or a magnetically charged object, it is with respect to this u 1. Pretty much uh, historically uh, following this Julia and z immediately generalized uh, the solution to include something which has both electric and magnetic charge okay. and uh, it is called the Julia z dion. So, this carries electric and magnetic charge. Okay, so, is, if you recall in our discussion of the Dirac quantization, we, we had only electrically charged objects and magnetically charged objects. You may wonder how to handle objects which carry both these charges, we will maybe at some point discuss it. Right now, I just want to tell you that the word dion is refers to something which carries both electric and magnetic charge again with respect to this u 1. So, uh, the thing <coughs> uh, this sort of uh, thing got impetus largely due to the work of Prasad and Sommerfeld, which is what we are going to discuss in this lecture as well as Bogomolny. We have discussed these names earlier, but this is the specific uh, example where they actually were able to in a particular limit. So, which which is called today it is called the Prasad Somerfeld limit. We will see what that is. In the Prasad Somerfeld limit, they were able to get an exact solution to the Euler Lagrange equation. And the ansatz they used was basically the same ansatz which they have used, these two people have used, but they are able to give an exact solution to the Euler Lagrange equation in a particular limit that limit is actually very interesting okay and later maybe time permitting i will discuss uh, uh, the bogomolny trick uh, or maybe in the next lecture so so let's start with uh, uh, yeah so when was this paper this was also in 1975 okay so i guess most of you were not born at that time so, okay. So, so let us sort of uh, work out the setup of this thing. The Lagrangian density is
Okay. So, the notation I am using is more or less uh, what was in Prasad Sommerfeld paper, maybe I should give the reference uh, since I have it here. It is P R L physical review letters uh, 35 number 12 volume 12. And the page numbers 760 to 763 pages, so 60, 61, 62 in 1975. Okay. So, this paper is at least accessible from within our campus because we have a subscription to PRL, but otherwise it is uh, restricted. Okay. And uh, so, what I did was to work with uh, more or less their notation except uh, the one change I had to make was that their metric convention is opposite. So, it is a minus plus 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 while we use plus plus minus. So, I have taken care of those details, but otherwise uh, basically these are the sort of things. So, f mu nu a, so it is an S O 3 or S U 2 Lie algebra value thing in the adjoint a is an adjoint index. And So, SO 3 adjoint or SU 2 adjoint has 3. So, A, B, C, D take values from 1, 2, 3. Epsilon A, B, C is just the structure constants of the SU 2 Lie algebra or it is a Levi-Civita tensor in 3 dimensions. Okay. So, this is the field strength, covariant field strength and pi is just a covariant derivative. Okay, it's just okay, and uh, here just A, B, C. We don't worry about upper, lower, because it's just an Euclidean. It's a Euclidean metric raised and lowered with the Kronecker delta. So really, I don't even bother with that. So I just write it this way. Thank you. Okay. So, you may have wondered what happened to the i's etcetera, but remember the way we wrote things there was a minus uh, there will be an i out here and the t's also have an i. So, it goes away okay. and uh, this plus or minus is really a sign convention. So, I am just sticking to whatever they wrote. Okay. So, so these two are just definitions and uh, so the, the so let us look at this and u of phi I just forgot to mention that u of phi is uh, lambda by 4 this is the potential yeah this is phi power 4 so here by mod phi square i just mean phi a phi a it's just summed over and so this is our uh, canonic uh, this is our normal potential which i can rewrite up to a shift plus some constant which i will we would have usually written it as a square but a little bit of thought will show you that this is just nothing but mu square upon lambda uh, time whole square okay so this so what we would have called a in the one potential which I have been using in this course would be mu by square root of lambda just to remind you. Okay. So, first thing to understand is what is the minimum or minima of u of phi of course, this is SO 3 invariant. So, what is the minimum uh, minimum of phi would be when mod phi square equal to a square which is a 
okay now thank you so what is this is an equation of so phi there are how many phi's there are three of them uh, so this is uh, uh, this looks like an equation of a three sphere but uh, there is also phi goes to minus phi which have to be identified with each other so it's really technically speaking it's s3 mod z2 with the antipodal points identified s2 sorry s2 right because all phi is going to minus phi is just a gauge transformation isn't it no it's not it's not uh, because that has determinant minus 1 so it's not an orthogonal transformation so it's okay i'll just huh yeah is but if you look at the uh, it's an orthogonal symmetry yeah it's so in that sense there is so anyway we can take it to be approximately s2 okay so let's not worry about these issues okay so so this is the set of vacua and uh, so and clearly it's uh, as long as uh, mu is non zero and uh, i mean this this quantity is finite we are okay so later we will see something uh, a particular limit which is to take uh, you take mu goes to zero lambda goes to zero such that the quantity mu square upon lambda and uh, just to for convenience of their definitions i think i should put an e somewhere so so goes to a constant okay so what does this constant do i mean you may think fine uh, it says that lambda goes to zero that means the potential is gone but there is some memory of the potential and what is that and that is remembered by saying that, that that this quantity is kept constant so it knows so what you're doing is saying that let's put boundary conditions at infinity or whatever so we'll be looking for solutions where this is not violated okay so this is the this is what is the pressure soma field limit and that's what makes life a lot easier you can see that you all uh, u of phi can be forgotten but uh, the only memory of that is the is this and this is the biggest simplification in this problem okay so your so the thing is to find the euler lagrange equations of motion now let's do a little bit more so uh, so let's just uh, work out yeah uh, so so the thing is that uh, so uh, if you if you if you do our analysis this exactly through higgs mechanism we will find that there are two two of the higgs bosons become massive uh, sorry two of the vector fields become the, the analog of w plus then w minus okay so mw square mw will be e times a but what is a it is mu by square root of lambda okay and prasad and some of will define this constant to be c i think just give me a second let me just sort this out yes so so the c is the constant defined okay so it's the mass of the w boson in okay so this is the mass obtained by the two gauge bosons okay so if you write the generators as a mu a in this way of saying it if you if we choose this to be along z direction what you will see is that uh, a mu plus minus become massive and a mu 3 is the unbroken u1 okay that is if you choose phi uh, suppose we went ahead and chose okay phi 3 phi a to be a times delta so that is what you can see now mu by square root of lambda delta a 3 
to just match whatever we we have discussed this particular example before okay i'm just putting in numbers etc not numbers putting a, uh, defining various things so suppose i did this okay i would get okay so so the idea is to look for finite so this would be the vacuum solution right so this is the vacuum configuration okay so what we will be looking for is finite energy so we will look for finite energy maybe i should say time independent finite energy solutions but okay time uh, time independent solutions okay and uh, so the key point is that uh, uh, so one of the things we will require is that as uh, so at this point we will not take the pressure sommer field limit we need not do this for this discussion so as uh, r tends to infinity so in spatial r is just x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square as r at the sphere at infinity you should find that phi mod phi a square should go to its web okay we need should go to mu square upon lambda is that correct mu square upon lambda okay so this is what should happen so this should be one of your boundary conditions okay and uh, there will be conditions on the gauge fields which i am not writing out for now but this is definitely one of the conditions that you will have to put in so the idea here is uh, is to think what happened in terms of the in the vortex solutions when we did because i want to think the way i took was approaching this problem so if you remember there what we found was that at asymptotic infinity we just saw that mod phi had to take some value but there was some region where finite region in which phi so bulk of the region phi was phi went to its web vacuum expectation value or its vacuum value but there was some region where it was uh, it was deviating from that and that was your flux tube and in fact you could we even worked out how fast it could die off and we saw that it was exponentially dying outside okay so th there's really a, a core out here so the same picture this is in but this now is in uh, is in two dimensions but you can think of the same thing in three dimensions where you have a core which is a, a, a solid sphere kind of thing outside which things actually quickly as reach this value okay so in that sense it's actually morally speaking exactly like the kink which had only so you know the uh, the support was finite i mean far away but the tan hyperbolic is actually exponentially decay okay so the energy was if you ask how much if you want 99.99% of the energy to be in this thing you'll find that uh, it will be there in a very small region whose size you can predict of course okay so the same thing we can do out here so what we would like to do is so in this region uh u1 is unbroken there's only a u1 so outside it looks like we have a gauge uh, we have only a u1 okay and if you go ahead and choose in any region if you go ahead and choose this we will say that mu3 is uh, mu3 would be the uh, u1 but suppose you want to write it in a gauge invariant way you could say that i could write something like a mu a times phi a divided by mod phi this this is sort of uh, uh, if you make any rotation global at least uh, you you can see that uh, so this this will reduce to what i said when uh, phi a is chosen to be uh, along the three direction phi 3 is non zero but that's not necessary you may choose something else okay so actually now you can ask what are the configurations which satisfy this thing so one thing we can see is that the set of so so you consider let r be the two sphere of some large radius so r is something outside all we really need is something very very large outside the core and uh, so what you have is this maps this phi is 
give you a map from S 2 of R to the S 2 in field space. Right, because these are constrained to lie on a sphere. Okay, suppose I permit my phi to rotate on this thing. Doesn't matter which one; it need not always be that that kind of thing. You can ask, what are all the maps? So, what you are interested in? You are interested in smooth maps, which go from s. So, what I have in mind is you just say phi a of r e power i phi. How does uh, not r? What am I writing? So, it is r theta and phi. So, the, uh, so, theta and phi are the points I just made it uh, into this thing. So, you can see that this, uh, so there will be this can also be written. So, this should be equal to what is the value it should be mu by root lambda times some other sphere. Okay, so, uh, what should I call let us call them alpha and beta. Okay, so, as uh, as theta and phi vary, so you will get two functions. So, these are the angles of these two this sphere. So, beta is like a phi say and alpha is like a theta. Okay, so, what you will get is two functions alpha of theta and phi and beta of theta and phi. Okay, and you can ask uh, is there a way of topologically classifying these maps. So, in other words you are not worried if I just go around somewhere and turn things around a bit. Okay? And we discussed this idea earlier when we took S 1 to S 1 in the case of the torus, but even here you will find that it is uh, the set of maps are classified by just some integer called z. Okay? And this z in principle should be related to, so it is some quantization should be related to monopole charge. Okay. We will we'll make things more precise, but what I am saying is that there will be a topological class into which you can fix your thing. And so, that in some sense uh, if you say that I am looking for a solution which has like vortex number 2 that implies that when you around went around once in this thing it that thing in field space it went around twice. Similarly, out here, so the simplest uh, one way of writing some winding number thing would be to say that you know I will give you one example of this z is that to choose alpha of theta and phi to be theta itself, but I can do this beta of theta and phi I can choose it to be n times phi. Okay, I am giving an example of a map this is a nice smooth map nothing wrong with it. So, you can see that what it is happening it is folding around n times and there is an orientation. So, you can get even negative is fine. Okay. But to this I can add any smooth functions which will jiggle it around they will all be in the same class. So, suppose you choose you are, suppose we went ahead and chose one of these things. The point here is that there exists a solution of the Euler Lagrange equation even though we may not be able to solve it. There is no way we can by any jiggling take a, a, take a solution with n going to n minus 1 or n minus 2. Okay. So, the vacuum solution would correspond to n equal to 0. Okay. So, uh, clearly uh, this, uh, so now you can see why I am saying that I cannot if I choose something like this everywhere, okay, there is no way I could get a solution which, uh, which has n not equal to 0. So, clearly this would not be correct. So, I need to permit myself for phi to go in different directions and so so, what I have in mind is that is why I am just sort of uh, looking at uh, this sort of a thing. So, locally if uh, anywhere I can always make a rotation if you give me in any small region I can always make a rotation. So, this uh, this R 3 is this phi space think of them as coordinates. So, at a given region phi will be in some pointing generically in some direction you can always rotate that and make it z axis, but you cannot do it everywhere there will be an obstruction somewhere you will run into trouble that is what this is telling you. Okay, but to make your intuition work this is useful. So, you, what you do is suppose in some region it looked like this where that we know that this has to be the u 1. So, this kind of tells you that this should be a naturally the u 1 which you should look at. 
Ah, yeah, it should be mod phi. Yeah, it's a unit vector in this space. Okay, it's confusing because there is physical space-time, and this this is a, and the space of phi that's also an R three. Okay, so what we'll be looking at today is the one solution. We will do this. I, I want to postpone it because we will we will do the we'll do exactly like what we did in the vortex case. Okay, so we just hold it for now. Okay. Oh, I erased the one thing which I needed next, but it doesn't matter. Okay. So what we need to do is to work out the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion, and uh, I will show you some tricks in where which will tell you that there are some terms which you need not worry too much about. You would have got that, that has to work. Okay, and this has got to do with symmetry. So for instance, suppose I wanted uh, so. Uh, let us say we wanted to get the equations of motions for a mu a. So, what we need to do is to do delta L by delta. Let me first write out f mu nu a equal to Okay, so <coughs> so now you can see that there are because of these pieces there will be uh, there will be this will be contributing even to when you do delta L by delta m u there is no contribution uh, I mean there was earlier no contribution coming from the kinetic energy for the this thing but now there will be but what I want to show you is that that term you could have written it even without this thing there's a way of fixing it without even doing the calculation okay so so let us look at this. So we want to do, let us say that we wanted to do mm, so let us do it this way a nu of b. Okay. So I am just playing around so that I get something which which I like. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So this is what uh, let us start with this and uh, so there was a minus one fourth thing. Why it's again as before? That one will not change. It's the same as whatever we got here, and it would be minus f uh, is it minus? Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. But we also need to work out a new b. Now comes the thing that we have exactly one more piece out here, okay? And uh, so again, you can see that uh, there'll be four terms, either from one coming from here, one coming from here, and the other f f square. So the four will cancel with the four. So I need to only work out one term. You know that that the rest will work out, okay? So what you will get is e. So I'll just look at one of these things. So the uh, and uh, from here I will get. So let us pick, yeah, I will I will choose the, uh, the part where mu and u are exchanged. So I get a minus sign so that I get a nu b. So I could write this whole thing like this, the same thing. Okay. So I can see that I get minus from this, and there will be a minus from the original action itself. So you get a plus and e epsilon a b c a mu c okay that is this part but then there is also the part which comes from covariant derivative of uh, this thing so let's let's call this dummy index new Sorry. B A C A new A phi C. Okay, so when I take a derivative of this, 
uh, of pi. Uh, the thing you can see that I will get I had it the way it should be you know and then okay. So, I just try am adjusting. So, what I have in mind is pi nu a whole square is what I have half of that. So, when I take uh, derivative of this there will be the two will cancel away and I will just get one piece which is this E. I get a phi c, but this will be multiplied by pi nu pi nu b. One second, let me pi nu a. So I should have a pi nu a. So now I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. There should be an f mu nu. Okay. Anyway, so so now you can see that the uh, so I have to take d rho of this and equate it to this. That's the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion. But here, I, this is where I want to point out that this term here is nothing but it has to go to the other side and work out, and has to be the covariant derivative of. We should convert this into a covariant derivative of this. This guy, as you can see, is transforms nicely under local transformation. Okay, pi e transforms nicely. This also transforms, so everything is nice. Okay, so right hand side is a vector, so this better be a vector. So finally, up to a sign, the so what we get is minus. So I just write it this way: d rho f rho nu b should be equal to. So I am not worrying about anything out here. I just throw this term. Forget about it. Should be equal to this. Pi nu b. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can see that there is there is a it's not as complicated as it looks because symmetry. I mean this equation better be nice. So your right hand side transforms properly. Left hand side will. Okay, so that that's what happens out here. Similarly, out here for a, uh, what is it you'd have written for a, you'd have written for a, a free scalar, you'd have written something like d rho of pi rho a should be equal to minus d u by d phi a. Now, you can see the left hand uh, right hand side again transforms nicely. Okay, and so the only way yeah, that can happen is to just go ahead and replace this by d rho okay and it's not a mystery how to write d rho of this thing because all these are in the same representation so it's exactly like this so there's no need to worry any but it's always a useful check you know what i do is when i do these computations i actually go back and say you know as a check of my signs i check does it give that answer i know that in hindsight Okay, so this is what you should get. Okay, so so now the thing is we have the equations of motion, and uh, one more thing we know is that in the Prasad sum of field limit, this term will vanish. The potential goes away. Okay, just remember that. So we need to make an ansatz. For the fields. So let me write out the ansatz, and this ansatz is due to a Tooft for the monopole case, and Julia and Z for the uh, for the Dionic case. Okay. So in the assignment which I gave you people, I was very kind. I did I did not uh, write the Dionic part because it's a uh, horrible mess to work through, but uh, it's good for the soul. 
So, okay. What is the what is the notation I used? Okay. Okay, so the so in the exam and here you can see that the, that the phi electrostatic potential, not electrostatic, the scalar potential also is non-zero, and so you will get an electric charge. Everything is time independent. Okay, so the electric thing will come from only this. So if you put J equal to zero, you should get what we saw in this thing. But the answer I want to write the most general thing, and uh, which was written out. So a zero, so a i a is epsilon a i j x j of r into 1 minus k r k of r by e r. Okay. So, key point here is that this uh, this first term which I have written out here actually has to do with the uh, with the fact that this charge is 1. Okay, that is there taken care of and the last bit is phi of a equal to x a by r okay, so there are three unknown functions j k and h. So, you can see here that this phi is along the radial direction as large values. So, what we wanted was we wanted as limit r tends to infinity, we wanted mod phi square which was phi a phi a to become <coughs> what was it supposed to be? It should be mu square by lambda, this is what we wanted. So, now we can look at this answer and ask what it does for h. Okay, so, what that tells you is that phi a phi a would be x a square which is r square, but there is a r power 4. So, it would be for the ansatz mod phi square is equal to h square divided by e square r square and this should tend to. So, h of r should tend to uh, this should tend to mu square by lambda s. Okay. So, this is the boundary condition that one has and uh, so now the point is is to go ahead and plug this ansatz into these these two equations and ask what does it look like. Okay. So, what I will do now is for the rest of the discussion I will only I will choose uh, uh, j equal to 0 to get the monopole solution. because it has no electric charge it cannot I mean if a 0 is 0 everything is time independent okay. and there are simplifications which come for instance here d rho rho can be written as just the spatial part because d 0 a 0 is 0 and d i just becomes that. Okay. And uh, so, the equations become so now we, we have set this equal to 0. So, the only unknowns are k and h and the answer says that these only depend radially on the radial variable. So, it simplifies a bit. So, the equations become r square k double prime now just for a moment let me write the full uh, let us leave it no, no I would not write it sometimes the temptation to say more than is necessary. Uh, 
okay now uh, the, this was given to you as your assignment to derive this thing and there are no shortcuts for this so what what you have to do is to take this ansatz first step compute what is phi second step work these things out and make no no mistakes to get this answer okay and uh, uh, Prasad and Semufil say that they with a bit of shimmying it is a kind of understatement because you need to get your everything right no sign mistakes nothing then you can you will get this equations. Okay. So, for me I just copy it from there, but it is something I would strongly recommend that you do. Okay. But now we can just look at this this term is obviously coming from this term is coming from the potential. Okay. So, now you can see that if, if I take the limit where lambda goes to 0 and the c is uh, this is already written uh, we already saw that c was uh, related to our a. So, really this part nothing is happening. So, lambda going to 0 this term drops out ok. So, there were questions asked by some people how did Prasad and Somerville find out I mean uh, that I do not know because I have not spoken to them, but uh, I think this was their observation that you know that the solution which they were able to write for this set of equations without this ok. So, this is uh, so that is the simplification which comes out ok this term goes away. So, then the equations actually have a nice solution ok. So, so now we are ready to take the Prasad soma field limit this would have been boring, but it was not boring because in that limit they were able to write the solution and the solution is very nice H. Okay. So, it is uh, I think it is very easy to check that uh, once you are given these two things that uh, these equations are satisfied, okay. but the actually uh, the, the uh, this high I mean if you think of the way uh, the of uh, how Bogomolny obtained the solution uh, the equations there actually it is like the like what we did earlier in the vortex thing when lambda was equal to 1 or e square or whatever that was you remember that uh, we could do this sum of squares etcetera and then we got this extra piece you can even here you can do exactly the same thing ok. And I will show this uh, not today because there is not enough time, but maybe in the next lecture we will see how these actually these these two are solutions not to a second no, I mean they are solutions to the second order equation, but they are actually solutions to a much simpler first order set of equations. And for first order equations it is easy to see what the solution should be. Okay. So, so we are more or less we are ok. So, now you can see now we can ask uh, what is the u 1 gauge field. So, now first thing to notice is that uh, that uh, phi a is along the radial direction Okay. So, so now we what we will do is we will define so the analog of a mu so let us let us use script notation let us define script a okay, to be that quantity which I wrote phi a divided by mod phi. Okay. So, this we will identify this is the gauge field. Okay. Almost this is almost right. Okay, so the 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 the, 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 the correct. So if you ask what is the field strength, so I'll put this in quotes because that could be derivative pieces, etc. So the field strength turns out to be uh,
where this hats here correspond to taking unit vectors. So, you can see that if you are in a region where you have turned all of them to become along the three direction obviously, this term will go off. So, then it will look exactly like that. So, that trick here is not going to tell you exactly how this stuff comes, but the nice thing is if you go ahead and evaluate what this f mu nu is. Okay. So, the, 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 the one way of yeah is to work this out and for this solution and ask what it looks like. So, what you do is of course, the time dependent part uh, f 0 f 0 i is 0. So, the only terms which would contribute are f i j which is like the magnetic field strength and then you can do epsilon i j k and the answer turns out to be very nice. and very very simple form r cubed correct. Okay. So, this is exactly like uh, so this, this is exactly what you would have written we wrote for a Dirac monopole. So, this is and this is being remember this being computed outside region okay, where everything is. So, so what we are doing is doing this computation if this is the region the all this definitions make only uh, sense in the region where the uh, u 1 s o 3 is broken to u 1 and all the others become massive. Okay. So, so this is exactly the Dirac monopole. Okay. Now, what is its charge? Its charge is 1. Uh, sorry so so it rip, so how did we what was the thing we wrote b yeah so so g by 4 pi should be equal to the sign is minus 1 by e okay so eg is equal to minus 4 pi What was the Dirac monopole condition? E g was 2 pi, right. So, this is this is not minimal. Okay. It has it has it, it could have been uh, it, I would say it is minimal if it was 2 pi, okay. but there are again topological arguments which tell you why this is true should be the case. We will may be uh, if it is if I can distill it into a form which I can explain to you I will explain it next time. Okay, so, we will stop here, but now we still have to ask what is the energy of this solution etcetera. Okay. No, you cannot for the SO 3 you cannot get this is the minimal, Minim, but it is not it is not minimal in the sense of Dirac quantization. Okay. So, I will stop here, we will continue next uh, next lecture, we will see how these things come, we will also see how these things uh, I mean uh, the, uh, these are actually solutions not this, but rather this is a solution to a first order equation and this will connect up with Bogomolny and this will really give you example of why Bogomolny Prasad, why these were called Bogomolny Prasad, Somerfield stuff. Okay. <coughs>